Hello! Today we're going to talk neither about Tesla coils, nor music, nor fucking bright LEDs. Instead, we're going to be talking about the theory behind a project that I wrote for Architects Project Posts. Uh, I have a, there, There's a blog over there where I post one electronic project a month. If you're interested, you should go over there and check it out, obviously. But this month, I built a field mill, which is a very specific kind of electric field sensor. Looks like this. And um, I'm going to be explaining a little bit the theory about how it works, and we're actually going to be going through the maths. Ignore that this is on the board. And we're going to figure out how the field mill works and roughly what sort of output currents we could expect. So in order to understand the field mill, we should start off by understanding the most basic uh, electric field sensor, which is just a plate capacitor or two metal plates next to each other connected with a current meter. And basically what happens if a field is applied to this is that the charges will move until the field inside the capacitor is entirely cancelled out by the field generated by these charges. So if we have a field of 10 volts per meter here, the, the charges will move from this plate to the other one until the field in the middle is zero. Now, these charges, when they move, obviously create a current and we can measure that. Now, how high is that current? Well, let's calculate it. Uh, it's fairly simple. We should just first of all look at the amount of charge that actually moves from one plate to the other, which is quite simple. We could just take that out of the capacitor equation, is C times V. Uh, I might actually accidentally write U instead of V because that's the German sort of formula symbol for voltage. So if I ever write a U or say U, I mean V, just if you're confused. So the charge is equal to the capacitance times the voltage. What is the capacitance? Well, it's just a plate capacitor. We're also going to assume it's in a vacuum, so there's no relative permittivity. And so our capacitance is just epsilon zero times A over D, the area of the capacitor, and this is the distance between the two plates, and our voltage is equal to the electric field times the distance. Now, if we put these uh, formulas together, we can already find out what sort of charges, how many charges are moving from one plate to the other. Q is equal to epsilon zero times A over D times our voltage E times D. You can see the D already cancels itself away. And we're just left with epsilon zero times A. No, not times epsilon, that should be an E times the field strength. All right, camera stopped recording, so let's just do that again. Uh, to figure out what current is flowing, we just need to differentiate the equation up here over time. So this is basically all that means. We just take the difference in charge over the difference in time. And if we look at this thing here, and we can see only the electric field is actually changing. Everything else is constant. Obviously, the size of the capacitor isn't changing, and the dielectric constant is obviously constant. <laughs> Who could have thought? We can simplify this to be epsilon zero times A times the difference in field over the difference in time. And this is our measurement current. Now, there's already one major issue that you can see with this, and that is the fact that if the field is steady, there's no change in the field, the output current is zero. So that basically means we are unable to measure fields that aren't changing. But we would want to do that in certain circumstances, for example, if you wanted to measure the field generated by clouds. So how do we do it? Well, quite simple. We just simply take the static field and turn it into a changing one. Now, we do that by basically having a rotor selectively shield and unshield our electrodes. So this is the same pattern as we have on the back here. These electrodes are all the same setup as this here. There's uh, sort of the common plate on the back, which could be, say, this one here. And then the front is the other plate. Now, the way what happens then is it, as it turns is that it shields the field. And as it continues to turn, it unshields it again, basically turning a static field into a changing one. All right, ignore the continuity error. I had to restart the recording a day later because the camera decided not to record any sound anymore. So when we left off, we were just about to apply the theory that we did to this to the field mill and to calculate its output current. So first of all, we would want to look at the total amount of charge moved again. Now, if we think of the field mill's uh, electrode as a capacitor with no field in it, the shielded part, and a capacitor with the field in it, it's basically two capacitors in parallel, 
just like so. That isn't supposed to be a battery, that is a capacitor. And again, our current meter across this. Like this. This here is C1, that is C2, and if we look here, C1 has no field in it, C2 has a field in it. And of course, because the charges that move are dependent on the field, C1 is effectively not there because it doesn't contribute to any charges. So the Q is only C times V of capacitor 2. So C2 times V2 is equal to epsilon 0 times area of C2 times the field strength. Then to calculate the current, we do the same we did up here, where we differentiated the charges. So we do dq over dt. And uh, unlike up here, where the field was constant, uh, the, where the field was changing, the area is changing now. So we get epsilon 0 times e times the change in area over the change in time. Now, what is the change in area? Well, if we look at this thing as just being a semicircle, which is increasing in the angle here. Uh, so the total area is just A is the angle over 360 degrees times R squared times pi. And we differentiate this again. So dA over dt. You could... Um, Hmm, I'm thinking about maybe you should writing down here because it's going to be hard for me to step further into the shelf. I can't really face through there. Um, it'll be fine. So, change in area over change in time. Again, all of these things here are constant except for the angle. So that's just change in angle over change in time times r squared times pi. Uh, and I forgot, times 1 over 360 degrees. Now, this... The change in angle, this, oh man, that's ugly. Let's do that. The change in angle over the change in time is also known as the phase rate, or 360 degrees times the rotational frequency. And then if we put all of these formulas together, we get out dq over dt, which is of course i, is equal to epsilon 0 times e times the change in area, which we calculated here, times r squared times pi times 1 over 360 degrees times the change in angle, which is 360 degrees times the rotational speed, which as you can see these two things cancel each other out, <clears throat> and we are left with epsilon 0 times e times r squared times pi times rotational speed. Frequency. Well, it's, it's the same. Rotational frequency. So this here is our output current from one electrode. Now we have, of course, got two electrodes connected in parallel. So we have twice this. So uh, that's i out 1, i out... Total is equal to 2 times i out 1. I'm not going to write this down again. Are we going to write this down again? Is equal to 2 times epsilon 0 times e. It's hard to write sort of at the bottom of a board. Times r squared times pi times rotational speed, frequency, whatever. And this is the actual current that we get out of our electrodes. Now, the total measurement voltage is actually twice this because as this thing gets shielded and has current flowing into it, the other electrodes get unshielded and they have current flowing out of it. And since we measure the differential, the total output voltage is equal to V out. Uh, and we're actually going to calculate the absolute value of it because the, the polarity isn't really going to matter. We get two times the current to voltage gain of our amp times our total output current. Now, I'm not going to write this down again because, well, it's literally just here. Just imagine...
<laughs> just imagine I wrote this here. Um, now, why is it twice here? That is just simply because we are doing a differential measurement. So if the one electrode has a positive output current and the output voltage is positive and the other one has a correspondingly negative output current and voltage, the difference between the two is obviously twice the output from one. And that, of course, also allows us to completely ignore any common offset. So if you had, say, a cable going past this, which uh, induced a 50 hertz hum onto this, it would be roughly the same on all of these things here. So, with, And with them all changing at the same rate, the distance between the two levels doesn't change and our output voltage completely ignores that. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, make sure to subscribe. I have some of these sorts of videos coming up and also some other videos. Uh, one, for example, where I tried to measure the LED junction temperature from just the current and voltage going through it using the Shockley equation. But that is uh, probably going to take a little while because it's actually hard to measure the Shockley parameters of the diode since we're not living in an ideal world, obviously. So yeah, thanks for watching and uh, see you next time. What am I doing in front of this board still? I should go away. Mm-hmm.